you know, as I sat down the airplane, tears were just running down my face and I just kept asking the question, why? Why? Why would you do this, Ryan? thought to myself, I, I just don't want to be here anymore. This pain is just too much. In October of 2003, John Halligan received the devastating news that his 13-year-old son, Ryan, had committed suicide. Since that time, he has traveled nationwide to share his son's story in hopes of preventing teen suicide. I spoke with him about how he copes with the loss of his son. The week before he died, he actually came to me in tears. He was uh, scared and he was, um, he was uh, very upset with himself that the progress report was going to be coming that Saturday and it was going to be really bad. And, uh, and he was tearful. And I looked at him and I said, Ryan, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud that you have the courage to tell me and give me a heads up. Don't worry about it. We'll wait until it comes. We'll look at it. We'll figure out where the weak places are and we'll come up with a plan. And we had a good hug. But in that conversation, he said things that now in retrospect are, were warn, warning signs that he was actually thinking of doing this. Um, he said things like, oh, dad, what's, what's the sense? I'm just a dumbass. I'll never amount to anything. I'm just a loser. And I have such regret for not stopping and asking more probing questions. I thought those comments were all about the progress report. And um, in reality, I think he was wanted to talk about more than just a progress report, that there were other things that were bothering him. But I didn't ask, you know, I basically said, Ryan, look, um, I'm not going to let you fail the eighth grade. Don't worry about it. I love you. Please don't ever think of doing anything to yourself. If anything ever happened to you, my heart would be broken into a million pieces. Where were you when you heard about Ryan's death? I heard about Ryan's death when I was away on a business trip. I was in Rochester, New York in a hotel room and my cell phone rang about 6.30 in the morning. And, uh, you know, the caller ID was my home phone number. I thought it was just my wife calling to, to ask where a book was or something because I typically took Ryan to school in the morning. But I was never prepared for what she was about to say. What were your feelings when you hung up the phone after you talked to your wife? So many uh, things were washing over me. As I heard the message from my wife, my, if you've talked to my wife, she'll actually claim that I hung up on her. I don't remember what I did exactly. I think I dropped the phone and I just didn't, I wanted somebody to wake me up. I wanted somebody to wake me up from this nightmare. Was there any specific memory of Ryan that you had during the first hours when you were on that plane? The memory that came to me right away as I was on that plane was that conversation we had the week before. I was uh, so devastated as I started to realize, my God, I had a chance to actually do something about this. You know, he was trying to tell me something and I didn't, I didn't let myself hear it completely. You know, I thought he just needed a hug and a pep talk and we ended it on a good note. And I just, I, it just never dawned on me to say something to Kelly about how negative he was at that point. Do you think you could have said anything that would have stopped him? I think anything would have increased the probability of keeping him alive. You know, we'll never know for sure if, uh, Ryan still would have done what he did if we even became more tuned in. I mean, I know of families where, you know, it becomes very apparent the child is suicidal. Some cases they've attempted and failed, so it's obvious. But tragically, they still try again and succeed. I don't know if we would have went down that path with Ryan. I will just never know. But I would do anything to take time back and be given a chance to help him. If you could go back in time... What would you say to him that you think would help stop what he did? Well, I've I've learned a lot about suicide itself and how to approach somebody who is at risk for suicide. So using that awareness and knowledge, I would have asked them the questions the experts say that you should ask. I should have asked them, Ryan, do you have a plan for suicide? 
Have you attempted suicide? The important thing about all of this is that you have to open up that door of communication and ask those very pointed questions. You can't say to them, you're not thinking of doing something crazy, are you? You wouldn't do that. When you when you approach it in that way, you actually shut down the, the communication. They don't feel comfortable about talking about this because now they feel the shame. You know, how shameful of me to even think of killing myself. How, And, and so they don't talk to you. Um, I think if I... Now that I have that awareness and training, I think I might have, I, I don't want to say easily, but I think we could have saved him by asking him that hard question. And if he said anything like yes, the next response should have been rush him down to Fletcher Allen and have him evaluated and have them keep him under watch until this crisis subsided, until we understood the reasons why and how we could help him. Do you ever think that if that's not what he had wanted, you would have done for him anyways? You know, hindsight's twenty twenty. I mean, I have this crystal ball now. I know what happened because we didn't do something. So with that vision in my mind, I would have just wrapped myself around him and I would not have let him go until we knew he was going to be okay, um, regardless of whether or not he was willing. I mean, I would have duct taped him to me. I just would have, I just wouldn't let him go. The morning you wake up after you know someone's dead, I've heard is the worst. Can you describe what you were thinking that morning? It was amazing I was able to even sleep that night before. Um, but your, you know, grief has such an exhausting impact on the body. And yeah, you wake up the next day and you're like, okay, this is just a nightmare. And then you realize as you wake up that this is still the reality. He's still not here. Those very first days of our loss of Ryan are very blurry to me because it was almost like I had to put myself on autopilot and not even think too much. At that point in time, it was a matter of now trying to su survive the wake, the funeral, the burial, and then let everybody leave so that I can sit down and now try to figure out how am I going to live with this for the rest of my life. Did you cope in any other ways? All through the wake, I just held on to a picture of him and me, a picture of him about the age of three on my lap looking up at me. I always loved that picture. That was always my favorite picture even before Ryan died. And I just held on to that like it was a security blanket. The people around us helped a great deal. I'd been around loss. You know, I'd lost my father actually six months prior to that. You know, you go through this process and you realize you need to be there to support people and hug them. But now being on the other side where it was so critical to even survive, to move, that I realized how important that truly is. You know, some people think when they, they write out a sympathy card and they send it that it's not that big of a deal. I got to tell you, every single card that showed up meant so much to me. That was another thing that was hard because those trickled away as time went on. For a while, it was like I'd run out to the mailbox praying that there would be another sympathy card in that mailbox. What did people do to help? Well, in the case of this kind of loss of Ryan, um, you know, you immediately feel a lot of different issues like shame, failure, like you, you've got to be the worst parent for a child to do something like this. And quickly, people rallied to our side and we were hearing things like, you guys were such loving parents. This just shows that this could happen to anybody. To this day, I still have a really hard time forgiving myself, but hearing that from others meant a lot to us. And people, especially our neighbors, you know, people that weren't even family members, cared so much about us. It was a wonderful experience around this awful tragedy to realize how um, compassionate and loving people truly are. Was there anything that people did that didn't help or made the pain worse? In terms of making the pain worse, there were these moments. And, you know, they subsided over time, but they, it still bothers me sometimes when I run into somebody that I know and they don't mention Ryan. I, I want to assume the best, and I think they're just so uncomfortable that they don't know what to say. So if they avoid me, they don't have to, to deal with this. People need to know when a parent loses a child, the last thing you should be worrying about is making them feel bad by talking about that child. You actually make us feel worse by not mentioning that child. You know, this isn't something you just get over. You will we'll never get over this. And you're not gonna make me feel bad by bringing up memories of Ryan. I actually feel better realizing that other people are still thinking about my son. 
Do you feel that you still have a relationship with your son? You know, it's not like I have a conversation with him anymore. It's just a feeling that he's with me somewhere. You know, I just ache to hear his voice again. It's like he's frozen in time. It's, it's, it's been so long since I've seen him now. But uh, I, I have a memory of my son, and that's what I'm trying to keep alive and trying to honor. How has your relationship with the other members of your family changed? Yeah, our family life and relationships changed a lot. People don't realize, you know, when somebody does something like this, it's not just them. It's everybody around them that just gets shattered. We all were very, very wounded, we, but we all love each other very much. But when you're wounded, it's hard. I don't want to say it's hard to love, but it's hard to be the way we were before. Every single one of us, including little Connor, has been to a therapist to talk about what has happened to us and our feelings and how to process and survive what has occurred. When you got such a hole in your heart, it's just, it created some distance. Closeness to Kelly was a, a challenge. We've regained a lot of that. But I felt so devastated and so guilty for that conversation I had with him the week before. I kept saying to her, honey, how could you ever forgive me? How could you ever love me again? You know, I expected her to want to just divorce, divorce me after that whole situation, after I told her what had happened. Um, but she is an amazing person. She's got a lot of capacity to forgive. And uh, we've grown closer, but in a different way. It's on a, I think it's on a much more spiritual way. And uh, so now we have this common bond of losing a child, and we both so desperately want to see Ryan again. I now look at my daughter with a lot of concern. That She's the one that found him, and she has been devastated by this whole experience. We were just such a fun-loving family and always joking around, and that part of our relationship basically went away since this happened. I mean, we still have our sense of humor, but it just isn't the same. None of us will be completely healed from this. Do you feel now that after Ryan, you've become a better parent? I want to believe that I've become a better parent. Um, I think I've become a different parent and that I'm more tuned to this other dark side of things that can go wrong. You know, I was always a very happy-go-lucky, very positive thinking, very cheerful, joking dad. And a good part of that dad died on that day. And I'm more of a, I'm a much more serious dad at this point, much more aware now of my two children in terms of how are they feeling and sensing when they're down to, to pause and ask a lot of questions now. Do you think that therapy you went through, do you think that helped a lot? Therapy is very interesting. You know, the hardest part of that I struggled with was, um, didn't Ryan love me? You know, why did he leave me? We were so close, you know. It, it just hurt so much that he, it, it is almost like he didn't care. But I realized that it was nothing like that. It really wasn't about me. It was about what was going on in his young teen life and how he was processing that pain. And I've come to the realization that when you become that age of around 12 or 13, it's less about your mom and dad and more about your peers and what's going on in your school life that gets very magnified and very important to you day to day. And, and that wasn't going well for him. And that was really the source of his great emotional pain. And so, you know, I've come to the acceptance that it wasn't about mom and dad or family. It was about what was going on at school and online. Do you forgive yourself for not talking to your son? This is the part of the therapy that I don't know if we ever got completely through it. I, to this day, have a really hard time forgiving myself. My path of trying to repair my mistake is by um, wanting to go and tell the story to young people, discovering now that it seems to help you know, I don't want a child going home and thinking about how Ryan did it. I want him to think about all the positive parts of this story, not the death part of it. I look at life now as a scorecard. You know, I just want to stack it up. God, look at all the Ryans I reached through all these talks that I did. Is it good enough? Do you remember before losing your son what you were most afraid of? 
Yes. Um, my wife and I, we often, we brought this up a few times, and any time we ever heard of somebody losing a child, we would always pause and say, you know, that has got to be the worst pain to lose a child. Uh, my wife would tell you, she often would say a prayer when we went to church every Sunday. In her prayer, she always included, please, God, don't ever let anything happen to our children. It's just one thing that a parent never wants to have to endure. But those few occasions where you you read the newspaper article and, and a young person dies, often I would stop and think about, boy, what would that feel like? And you have no idea. I go back and I think about those moments I had no idea what this would really feel like. And so I've run into parents, you know, and they say, you know, I can't imagine the pain. And I said, you know, you can't. You really can't. And unfortunately, I have a coworker who we had this conversation just this past no early November. And tragically, two weeks later, he lost his son in an accident. And when I saw him, he he didn't have to say a word to me. I felt so bad, but it was a, it was kind of strange that we even had that encounter. It was almost like God wanted me to prepare him to start to think about what this might feel like. But he said what I tell other people. He goes, you know, he told me, yes, now I know. And I said, I know, I know you know. What could you possibly say to a parent that lost a child? The words aren't important. Your being there is enough. Just be there. Just hold that person. You know, the human condition, we want to say something, we want to say some magic words that are going to make that person feel better. There are no words to say, but the comfort and your sympathy is so valuable to that person at that point in time. Don't get hung up with what to say. Just be there. Do you feel that as time goes on, it becomes any less painful? As time goes on, you learn how to function again. You know, in the very beginning, every single nanosecond was about Ryan. And I had total inability to do anything else. I mean, I had to write a to-do list every day of just what do I need to do to get through today? I had to keep looking at that list to figure out where I was at next. As time went on, the gaps in between the thoughts of Ryan start to increase. And you start to function again. And you start to think about other things. You never get over this. There's no getting over it. My daughter said it really well she goes this is not something you get over you get from underneath i think losing a child is sort of like losing a limb you just you can never do everything you did before but you can still function there's nothing more i want now for the rest of my life than to earn the right to see my son again i know ryan's in heaven and i all i can think about now is what do i got to do to get there myself what do you miss the most about ryan I miss his presence. I miss him just being there next to me. We had a really fun love and relationship. We loved to joke. We used to love watching the Comedy Central channel together and we loved we loved to laugh together and I miss I miss him being next to me and hearing him laugh. He had the best laugh. To me laughter I always equate it to happiness, but I guess I, um, I guess that wasn't always the case. Silent night, broken night. Nothing's changed. Nothing is right. I should be stronger than weeping alone. You should be weaker than sending me home. I can't stop you fighting to sleep. Sleep in heaven. You've been listening to John Halligan. This is Becca Starr with Youth Radio Vermont.